Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the second message of our Advent series, The Light Has Come. And we're going to be looking through the first 18 verses in the book of John. Last week, we, we looked at that pre-eternal, pre-incarnate existence of the light, Jesus. And we saw how Jesus was much more than just a baby who was born in a manger, born in a stable, and who would eventually become a great moral teacher. Jesus was more than that. He was the light. The light was God, God pre, pre-incarnate. John, in those first, four verse, first few verses, he gives us a glimpse into the invisible world, the, the world before creation, and he points us to the source of all life. Well, in these next three verses we're going to look at today, verses 6 through 8, John's going to begin us on the journey, the journey of the incarnation. And he's going to begin by shifting from that spiritual realm to the physical realm. And he's going to do that shift by introducing us to John the Baptist. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you for the privilege of being able to go and to study your word. I pray now that as we look at at John the Baptist and, and what you've done through his life, I pray that you would just speak to us and you would show us the responsibility that you've given us and and how you've prepared us to be a witness, to be a witness to the light and to share the love, the love of Jesus to a lost, dying, and divided world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you turn with me in your Bibles to the first chapter of the Gospel according to John, If you don't have your Bibles, please use one of the Bibles in the pew rack in front of you. You can use that. It's on page 886. 886. And we're going to be reading. I'm going to read through all 18 verses so that when we get to the verses 6 through 8, what we're going to focus on, we'll be able to see that within context. And and just so that we, we remember all of what John is trying to say in those first 18 verses. So, follow along with me as I read the first 18 verses of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth." John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. You know, in verses 6 through 8, John the Apostle introduces us to John the Baptist. Now, I'd be real careful here because it gets a little bit confusing at times because there's a difference between the writer of the, of the Gospel of John and John the Baptist, okay? So, so when I'm, when I'm going to talk about this, and sometimes I'll refer to the writer, uh, John the Apostle, and sometimes John the Baptist. So just try and follow along with me. I'll try and keep the two distinguished as much as possible, okay? So we're all on the same page here. Well, John the Apostle doesn't say much 
about John because he wants to make clear in this section that John's role is secondary to Jesus' role. Yet in spite of that, John still inserts this little segment about John the Baptist in the middle of this glorious pronouncement of Jesus. And you see, although John was not the light, although John was not the savior of humanity, he still played an important part in God's plan for the world. In fact, in these three verses, the gospel writer reveals two things about John the Baptist that's also true about you and about me. And the first thing, the first thing we learn about John is that he was appointed by God. He was appointed by God. In verse 6, we read that there was a man sent from God whose name was John. John was appointed by God for a purpose. In the Gospel of Luke, um, it's emphasized in a number of different ways from before John's birth. For example, the angel Gabriel came and spoke to Zechariah, John's father. And then we see it again when John's mother, Elizabeth, who is by this time pregnant with John, is made aware that Mary is carrying the unborn Messiah in her womb as a result of John, who leaps within her womb, who's already filled with the Holy Spirit. And so she becomes aware that Mary is carrying the Messiah. Finally, after John's birth, Zechariah again, filled with the Holy Spirit, prophesies that John will prepare the way for the coming Messiah. He will have a purpose. John has a purpose. John's purpose is to be the forerunner of Jesus. John is already fulfilling this purpose before he's born. While he's in Elizabeth's womb, he's already proclaiming to Elizabeth that Mary, that the unborn child that Mary is carrying is the Messiah. Can you believe that? Already, before John is born, he is carrying out the purpose that God has appointed him for. But why introduce John here in the middle, in the middle of this glorious prelude about the coming of Jesus? Why not introduce John after the writer finishes telling us about John, Jesus the light? Well, I think it's because the gospel writer wants to stress that Jesus is the source of all creation. And he is also the source of the revelation, of his revelation to man. The writer wants us to see that John was not only divinely called, but he was also divinely prepared. The apostle John does this in a very interesting way. When introducing the word the, when introducing the word in verse 1, the apostle uses the normal past tense word was. I put it up here. You can see the simple past tense word for was is in green. It just was. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. That's a simple past tense Greek word ain. The simple past tense for was. But now when John gets to describing who Jesus is, or, or who, when he begins to introduce John the Baptist to us, he uses a different word. He says, there was a man sent from God. He doesn't say a man was sent from God. He says there was a man sent from God. And the, the reason is because the Greek word there is agenital. Now agenital means come into existence. To, you could say, to be made. And John uses that word in the first three verses of, of the John chapter 1. He says, um, all things were made through him. So all things were again atowed through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So in other words, all things were again atowed through him, and without him was not anything again atowed that was again atowed. Okay, so now you got your little Greek lesson here, okay? So, so you can see that's very clear. But then, now when he starts talking about John the Baptist, he says, a man was again a toad sent from God. So he's saying that John was created. He came into existence. He came into being. See, John the, John the Apostle is making clear that there's a distinction between John, the Word and John the Baptist. The word was not created. The word was. The word always was. He did not come into being. John, on the other hand, like everything else, owed his existence to the word. John was created by the word so that he could be sent by God to fulfill the purpose that God had for him. John, or Jesus, in effect, was creating his own forerunner, his own herald. 
Verse 6 ends with the identification of John. Notice God uses, is, was using an individual, a real flesh and blood person with a personality, somebody with a history, somebody named John. So how does this all relate to us? Well, first of all, we see that God uses people. God uses people to accomplish his purpose. He used Joseph in the Old Testament to save the embryonic nation of Israel from famine. And then he used Moses to free the people out of slavery, to free this new nation out of slavery. He raised up judges and prophets. He called out Esther. He called out Esther. He set her aside. So when the nation was on the verge of genocide, God used Esther to save the nation. He sends Peter to reveal God's plan of salvation to the Gentile Cornelius. God in his sovereignty allows people to the privilege of participating in his cosmic plan. Not only does God use people, people like John, each and every one of us have been divinely created for a purpose. Like John, we have been sent by God and not just sent but divinely and masterfully prepared and designed to accomplish the purpose that God has made for you. What's, what is true for Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 5, is also true for you. God tells Jeremiah that before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Before Jeremiah was born, God had a purpose for Jeremiah, and that was to be a prophet. We read the same thing in the New Testament. Paul writes us, tells us in Ephesians 2, verse 10, that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus with good works, which, he, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, God has a purpose for you. God has created you for a purpose. He has a job for you. Even before you were born, God had something planned for you. Friends, God created you for a purpose. In Christ, your life has a purpose. You have a reason for being. The problem is, oftentimes, in our pride, we refuse to see that purpose. Let me share with you a story. This is a true story. This is my story about my call before I went as a missionary. You see, when I was a child, I really felt God drawing me towards missions. I really, I really was pulled towards, towards being used by God to tell people who have never had an opportunity to hear the gospel to hear the gospel. But I was very insecure. And I felt like God could never use somebody like me, right? I was, in a way, I was almost a little bit bitter against God, you know, a little bit frustrated because I would hear all these people, these great, wonderful missionaries, people come by and they were sharing how, how God had, how they were involved in some other kind of work or whatever and, and, and they were brilliant and, and God had to, had to just really wake them up and shake them and drag them to get them to go to the mission field, right? And I thought, man, I'd be more than willing to go, but God, you did not, you messed up. <laughs> you did not give me any of the talents. I'm not a great public speaker. I, I got really nervous in front of speaking in front of people. I, I'm not, I was average student, you know, I wasn't brilliant. I wasn't some brilliant surgeon or, or doctor or something like that. Well, all the missionaries I knew, they were all either doctors or great speakers, you know, and I didn't fit in any of those categories. So I said, you know what? God, you can't use me. I'm just not good enough. You messed up. You gave me the desire, but you didn't give me the ability. And it wasn't until I was in college at a missions conference that God hit me upside the back of the head and said, Erwin, who do you think you are? Do you think that you and your weakness are more powerful than I am in my strength? Are you more powerful than God Almighty to think that I can't use you, that you can thwart my purposes? It was arrogant. It seems humble, right? It seems humble to say, oh, well, I'm just not really good enough. But in reality, what it is is pride. Because you've just set yourself up. I've just set myself up before God, above God. Don't be like that. Don't be like I was. Don't think that God can't use you because of some fear or some lack of faith. Don't disobey God's call on your life. Be 
be bold, go forth in faith. It may mean going as a missionary, but it may mean just sharing Jesus with a family member or neighbor or even a stranger. It may mean serving or loving somebody who's hurting, somebody who's alone, maybe caring for somebody who's unlovable. It may mean giving of your time or your resources. It may just mean praying for somebody that everyone else has forgotten about and given up on. Whatever God is calling you to do, be faithful because he has called you and prepared you for that very purpose. We read that there was a man named John. Well, you know what? There is a woman named Lisa. There is a teenager named Bill. There is a single person named Becky. There is a person sent by God, and that person has your name. So that's the first thing that we hear. That's the first thing we learn about this passage is that, is that John had an assignment. He, or God, John was appointed by God. And just as John was appointed by God, so we also are appointed by God. The second thing we see is that in addition to being appointed by God, John was given a specific assignment. And his assignment was to be a witness and to bear witness about the light. We read that he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. See, God doesn't need man when it comes to accomplishing his purposes. In Matthew, we see that God used the star when he announced the incarnation to the Magi. In Luke, he uses the angels to bear witness to the coming of Jesus, to the shepherds. But here, in, God's, in John's gospel, the instrument emphasized to proclaim the advent of the Savior is a man. It's interesting that it's through people that God usually chooses to reveal his truth to others. You see, God could have used the angel that came to Cornelius in, in Acts, the book of Acts, to reveal him to him the message of salvation. But instead, the angel tells Cornelius the centurion, the Gentile centurion, to send for Peter. And then Peter comes and delivers the gospel message. He m delivers a message of salvation. Brothers and sisters like John, you too have been given an assignment. You've been given a commission. And it's to go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus calls us to be his witness. In John chapter 17, Jesus prays for his disciples and he prays for those people who would come to faith through his disciples. That's you and me. And he prays for us, and as he prays, he proclaims that just as he has been sent by the Father, he, so he now sends us. You have an assignment. And like John, your assignment is to make Jesus known. Now, you may be thinking, okay, Erwin, I know what you're saying. I need a witness. I need a witness to the lost, but, but I can't do that. I've tried and I've never seen anyone come to faith, even though I've shared my faith with them. And I feel like a failure. Please, please don't guilt me into doing something that I just can't do. You know, it may be that you're an introvert, and all those methods that you've been told are so fantastic, they just seem really artificial to you. Or to be honest, maybe you're just afraid. You're afraid of what people think of you, or maybe you're even afraid that you might do something or say something that will turn somebody away from Jesus forever. Maybe you have those, those fears. Well, let me set your mind at ease. A lot of what you've been told about witnessing or thought you've been told about witnessing may not be true. You see, witnessing is not about closing the deal. It's, it's not in sales. You see, when you're in sales, if you don't close the deal, you get fired right? You've got to sell something, right? But that's not what witnessing is about. Witnessing is about showing people who Jesus is. It's, it's showing the world that Jesus is real and that he is important to us, that he makes a difference in our lives. Remember that last point when we said that you have been specially designed by God for your assignment? Well, you know what? God has made everybody the same. So how Pastor Floyd or how Pastor Eric witnesses is going to be different from how God wants you to witness. God did not make, make everybody a Billy Graham. 
he made you, you. So let me give you some ideas of what witnessing can look like. Well, it might mean helping, just helping a neighbor who's hurting next door. It might mean listening or crying to somebody with somebody who's hurting. It may be bringing a plate of cookies to a neighbor or inviting someone to your home. Let me tell you a story, another story. When I was overseas, when I was um, working as a missionary among uh, Kurdish refugees, Muslims in Germany, I met a guy named Abdul. He was a great guy, really nice, nice fellow, and he'd been living in Germany for a number of years. And it was around Christmas time, and Abdul said to me, you know what, in my country, in my country, if you were to come and you were to live with us and, and we knew that you were there and we were to have like some kind of a Muslim or Islamic celebration, we would invite you. Even though we know you're a Christian, we would still invite you to come. That would just be what we would do. It would just be the hospitable thing to do. He said, but you know, I've been living here in Germany for so many years and not one person has ever invited me over to their home for Christmas. He was hurt. He wanted to be invited. He wanted to know what's going on. Friends, sometimes it's just as easy as just inviting somebody over to your house. If you have the gift of hospitality, God has prepared you, he's created you to use that gift to share his love. It may mean just asking questions. Greg Cockle in his book, Tactics, a great book. If you want to get a great book on, on sharing your faith, Greg's book on um, ta called Tactics, Cockle, it's spelled K-O-U-K-L, okay? It's a great book to get. And he talks about the fact of just asking questions. He says, just putting a pebble in somebody's shoe, getting them to think about it. You don't have to do the whole gospel presentation. You don't have to pray with them. But just ask them a question and get them thinking about it. You know, when we were overseas, one of the things that we did was when, when we were sharing, when we were with other people, our kids would take care of the little kids of the families we were visiting, which would free us up so that we could talk and, and focus on the people who God has brought across our path. And our children saw that as a role of witnessing. And that was just taking care of little kids so that the parents could hear. Maybe that's something you could do. Maybe you can volunteer to help um, with, the, with the nursery or with something else like that, and just being available so that you can free up parents so that they can hear the gospel. See, that's witnessing. It's doing little things. Remember, a witness does require some kinds of proclamation oftentimes, right? But it's often less than we think and more than we do. Okay? We don't want people to think highly of us and never knowing that Jesus is the one who made the difference in our lives. Okay? But you aren't the one who brings people to faith. That's Jesus. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Remember, John was not the light. John was not the light. He was to bear witness about the light. See, and when we focus on, on what we can do and how well we can do it, and we focus on ourselves, what we're doing is we're shifting the attention away from Jesus, away from the message, and we're shifting it upon ourselves. So, it's, so don't worry about you. Don't worry about the results. The Holy Spirit will do that. We are just the vessels that God uses and there's nothing that we can do that will keep those who God has called from coming to faith. That is freeing. You can't mess up God's plan. Okay? And the other thing is that you all have different roles. We have different places to play. Um, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, Who then is Apollos? Who is Paul? Servants through whom you have believed. As the Lord has assigned to each, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So it's neither he who plants nor he who waters who is anything, but only God who gives growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wage according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. You see, we all have a different role to play. It's kind of like that scale. You remember, have you ever seen one of those old pharmacy scale kind of things that go like this? And you put a five pound weight here, and then on the other side, you start dropping some metal ball bearings. And eventually, the scale's going to tip, right? When you put enough ball bearings on there. But which is the important ball bearing? Which is the most important one? Is it the last one that you drop that causes the scale to tip? No, because you know what? If you didn't use the first one, then that last ball bearing wouldn't have made any difference. Or if you would have taken out the one in the middle, it still it wouldn't have tipped. You see, each ball bearing has a role. Each person has a place. You may be the one who's just preparing the field. You may be the one who, who, who God uses to get the person thinking about his eternal destiny. 
You may never see the result of what you have said. That may be somebody else's role to harvest, to, 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 to lead somebody across that threshold. I remember reading an article um, about a, a lady, and she was specifically talking about this point. And she was saying that when she was sick and she was in the hospital, she had never really thought about God. But there was a nurse there who prayed for her, who cared for her, who talked to her about Jesus. And for the first time, she began to think about spiritual things. She left off. She never accepted Christ at that point in time. And she says, I don't even remember the name of that nurse. And that nurse probably does not know what has happened. But that nurse had a powerful effect. Because of her, I began my journey of seeking God, seeking answer to my life. And God brought other people to my life. And finally, I came to faith. You see, it doesn't matter what you do or where you're at. You just have to be faithful. You just have to let Jesus shine forth in your light. So what does that mean? You remember the old Christmas song? Or the old, I'm sorry, the old Sunday school song. This little light of mine. Do you remember that one? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Remember the second verse? You can join with me if you want. Hide it under a bushel. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Don't hide the light under the bushel. Just this week I came across a poem by John Sanford. It's called, They Never Heard of Christmas. It's a powerful, powerful poem. Let me read it to you here. It says, Why have we not heard of Christmas? Why have you denied us light? We have, we who long have groped in darkness, chained by sorrow, sin, and night. Why have you refused to tell us of this son born from above? Why have you withheld such tidings of God's condescending love? When was it that you learned of Christmas? Has a story just been told or just been heard? Can it be that God would send him just for you who hold his word? Will you, will you still deny us Christmas? Will we reach out in vain? Can it be that we must perish never having heard that name? All our fathers died in torment, racked with anguish, fear, and pain, never knowing of a Savior, never breathing Jesus' name. Hear the words of hopeless millions dying where no light has been. Won't you share this Christ of Christmas? Let him save us from our sins. Friends, we just lit the light, the candle of love. Is it loving to hold on to the truth and not sharing it with those who need the message of salvation? There are millions of people around the world who have not had an opportunity to hear the gospel. And I'm so excited that we at Christ Community, we, we have a passion for missions and that we give, that your, your designated giving goes towards missions so that we can send people to places where there is no opportunity, where there's no other gospel witness around so that people can hear the good news of Jesus Christ. But you know what's sad? What is just as sad as those, those millions who haven't, don't, don't have a witness near them, some to share the light? You know what's really sad? Is that there are people here who do have a light close by and they still haven't heard. There are people here who, who are hopeless, who think that nobody cares, who thinks they don't matter. And you know, 
You know that they do. You know that Jesus came and he came and he died on the cross so that he could pay the penalty for our sin. So that we can have a purpose, so that we can have a relationship with the Father. But we hold it to ourselves and we don't tell them because of fear, because of pride. Friends, this is part of what the Advent story is. It's sharing, sharing the gospel of Jesus. Don't, don't hide your lamp under a bushel. Don't deny people the freedom, the freedom to know the good news of Jesus Christ.